Coming up next, seven reasons why employees hate their leaders and then teachers who have left the classroom to be successful entrepreneurs. And then we have a pizza delivery problem. We'll cover it all. Plus, coach you up right now. All right, folks, welcome to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you discover and do what you were born to do, giving you the competitive edge to make more money and to make more impact in your career. Thrilled to have you with us. Uh, we've got today kind of a fun little thing here on the table. We've got our Instagram audience, at Ken Coleman. They are tuning in live. Hello, hello, hello. And, of course, we have folks watching live on YouTube, and uh, we call them the YouTube crazies. We'll get in the chat room maybe a little bit later. So welcome one and all. Let's go. Seven reasons why employees hate, despise, can't stand their leader. I mean, we see more and more of this in today's world, right? Where horrible bossery is what we call it on the show, is why people leave. They don't leave companies, they leave leaders. So I've worked with a team and, and we came up with a list of seven. There's probably a list of 70, but we wanted to kind of fine tune it into seven reasons. So let's get into it. Number one, not being accessible. When your leader is not accessible, it creates all kinds of frustrations, and those frustrations mount. You can't ever get to them. You need a little bit of feedback. You need their help. You need their uh, input on something, and they just seem like they don't have time for you. You're a bother. Number two, how about cryptic communication? This is one I. <laughs> this is one that I, has always been a pet peeve for me. Leaders who speak kind of in in gray, not black and white, right? Ew. What did they really mean by that? Are they manipulating me or are they just horrible communicators? Sometimes it's both. Cryptic communication. It's where your manager will schedule a meeting, uh, but they never really tell you what it's about. It's like the old dreaded, we need to talk. You know that? And the relationship, thing? that's never any good. And then you're dying inside. Why, why do we need to talk? That can't be good. Are you dumping me? What's going on? The cryptic communication from leaders creates all kinds of stress and anxiety. It's horrible. Number three. How about revealing big news that has an impact on you, but they don't tell you one-on-one, -on -one, they tell you in a group setting. So you have no time to process it. It's just like, hey, everybody, we're cutting benefits. <laughs> just dropping that on you. Number four, micromanaging. Oh, boy, oh, boy. This could be an entire show. In fact, every time I, I do a Q&A on Instagram, uh, I'll say, ask me anything, and people ask me all different types of questions. But one of the things that we see a pattern of is how do I handle, how do I deal with a micromanaging leader? I mean, this is a big one. Uh, I like to call micromanagers seagull leaders. Seagull leaders. Yeah, you know what a seagull leader is, right? All they do is fly in, squawk crap on everybody, and then they fly away, right? Right? I mean, the, the micromanager is a seagull leader. There's, there's nothing good happening there. And, and let me just give you a little extra insight on this before we move through the list. Just because they're a seagull leader, and by the way, this makes them a horrible leader, doesn't mean they're a horrible person. I want to call this out. I, I don't want you to demonize somebody who has either never been taught or never been modeled the way to lead from a servant standpoint. So all they've ever known is, got to fly around, make a bunch of noise, look like I'm leading, and then I'm unintentionally or sometimes intentionally crapping on people. All right, so the micromanager. They tell you exactly how to do it. Instead of, instead of giving you space to do it, they, they may instruct, but then they keep instructing and they hover. I mean, who among us does well with a hover? So uh, give you an example where I really struggle with hovering. So I'm self-taught, Alex, as a typer. You've seen me type. It's not pretty. Uh, I didn't take typing in high school. I hated it. It was an elective. I was terrible at it, so I skipped it. And so I'm self-taught. So I'm functional typing. But here's what happens. All right, I'm going to kind of, for our viewing audience, if somebody comes up behind me and I'm even just searching for something, so let's say Alex was up, we're searching for something on Google, and Alex is standing there or Amanda is standing there over my shoulder and I have to type something, I turn into this. I'm pecking with it. It's like I get all I get all anxious. Why? 
They're hovering. Uh, give you another example. I love to play golf. All right. If I'm golfing with my friends and I get up to the tee, you know, I, you know, I got a little bit of performance issues going on there. Everybody does. Okay, like, all my buddies are watching. But it's really worse when another foursome comes up behind you. You don't know these people. And they're in the cart behind you watching you tee off. Oh, boy, it's terrifying. So very few of us do well with hovering. We get that. So with micromanaging, what do you do? You're going to have to put that out of your mind. You're going to have to show a little bit of respect to the position, but you're just going to have to largely ignore the hovering or you move on. And by the way, most people move on from micromanagers. They don't stay anyway. So there you go. Number five, how about the leaders who pit workers against each other? This is manipulation, right? They kind of manipulate and they use one person to send a message to another person instead of being the leader and dealing with it directly. Oh, I can't stand that. That'll drive dissension deeper than any other poor leadership tactic. Number six, how about leaders who take credit for your work? It's the classic Michael Scott, right, from The Office. You do a good job, you deliver the results, and your leader takes all the credit for it as if you weren't even involved. Boy, again, that'll drive a wedge quickly. Uh, how about number seven, the unhelpful feedback. So it's not constructive in that it gives you something to be able to process and go, okay, I didn't do this the right way. Here's the right way to do it. Or I didn't meet expectations. Here's why, but here's how you can meet them in the future. So it, it's a little bit of a, a sandwich, right? So we, we got some constructive criticism and then we got some encouragement, right? Kind of sandwiched in there with, okay, now go do it. Empowerment. That's a great little sandwich for leaders. Hey, Constructive criticism, encouragement. It's okay. It's not the other world. Here's how to do it. Instruct. And then, boom, go do it. You don't have to be worried about messing up again. Take the lessons you've learned and move on. This is healthy leadership. But unhelpful feedback is where you just get criticism only. And you largely walk out of the office or out of the interaction, and you're just kind of like, uh, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. And this is what a lot of leaders do. They think, in criticizing and showing, well, you didn't do this the right way. Uh, but boy, I got, I got a fun parent project coming up with my boys. My two teenage boys, they're unaware of this yet, Alex. Uh, but they're about to be voluntold that they're going to stain our fence. We we replace some posts and some slats in the, in the backyard fence. And uh, so it occurs to me, wait a second, I'm a grown man. I, I do everything for these kids. They're 14 and 16. Hey! I'm not going to stain my fence. They haven't been told this yet. This is going to be very exciting for me to break this news. Uh, but but here's the deal. When they start to stain it, they will inevitably not do it very well. And I have to come alongside and go, hey, look, here's how you do this. So just as I have a relationship with my boys, leaders need a relationship. Because the problem is, is these behaviors I just laid out, they create dislike and distrust. So what's the solution? Leaders, just Treat your people like I'm going to treat my boys. I care about them. I'm going to show them to do it the right way. I'm going to encourage them that they can do it the right way and go. Healthy relationships in the workplace creates trust and loyalty. You got to treat people like they matter. In the news is next. Don't move. You were created to fill a unique role in this world, but figuring out what that is can feel overwhelming. That's why we created the Get Clear Career Assessment. In less than 15 minutes, you'll get customized results that clarify and verify what you do best, the work you love, and the results you want to produce. You'll even get a list of professional possibilities to help you jumpstart the job search. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash assessment. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, helping you get the competitive edge to do what you were born to do. And in that competitive edge to do what you were born to do, guess what's going to happen? You're going to make more money and you're going to make more impact in your professional life. Who doesn't want that? So excited to have you with us. 
Uh, today, I'm doing a little fun thing. I got some Instagram folks that are watching live at Ken Coleman on Instagram. Uh, I want to say a shout out to uh, all of you that are listening uh, live on Sirius XM, uh, your talk radio station, watching live on YouTube. And those of you who will listen to the podcast later, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us today. We've got our live chat room uh, on YouTube, the YouTube crazies. Uh, and so here we go. As a man of the people, I am here for you, your coach, your guide, your advocate. I keep you up to date on what you need to know in the news. Let's go. All right, folks, uh, this makes me a little bit sad, but it also makes me a little bit happy. This is a bittersweet article because I've been talking about this issue for a while, that we have a crisis in our public education system where the system itself is broken because of bureaucrats and politicians. And the victims are teachers and principals and kids. And teachers are leaving at alarming rates. Let's go into this story. Our YouTube audience loves when I crinkle the paper. So that tells you this is serious business. When I do this... It means pay attention. All right? Here we go. Teachers are quitting in record numbers and starting six-figure businesses. Here's how four entrepreneurs did it. This is an article from Business Insider, and it highlights four teachers. We'll get to their stories in a moment. But again, for those of you who are new, we got a lot of people joining the show all the time. What do I mean when I say we have a crisis in the public education system? Well, the system is all about politician scores, and getting reelected, it's not about educating kids. So everything's about these standardized tests. As a result, we're pounding curiosity out of our kids, generation after generation, and we're creating kids that become adults who are answer givers. In other words, test takers, not pathfinders. That's the big overarching problem. But the dumpster fire that's going on are these numbers. Teacher pay is $2,100 less than 10 years ago, and 55% of educators plan to leave the industry early. This is according to the NEA, the big teacher union. This is, these aren't my data points. These aren't conservative Republican talking points. This is the NEA. Uh, by November of last year, 66% more K-12 through teachers quit their jobs than the same month a year prior. That is alarming. This is a report from LinkedIn. The pandemic, it was already an exhausting job. The pandemic made it, made it worse with the double duty of they had to prepare uh, online learning courses along with the classroom. In certain states, they were back in the classroom more than others. It just created more and more work. I've talked to teachers over the last three months. I've talked to uh, over a handful of teachers, and they've all told me, that uh, the additional workload is straining their ability to actually instruct. Did you get that? People are leaving in droves. The data on principals is nearly as high. This is a problem. And we the people are in charge of this. It's time we stop letting politicians and bureaucrats decide how we prepare our kids for their future. That's another show. I want to encourage teachers who do want to leave. You're done. And I get a lot of those calls. These are four amazing stories. Amanda Smith from Dallas started hosting brunches and workshops for women in 2017 after moving to Dallas and not knowing many people. Well, it began as a way for her to make friends and turn uh, actually turned into conferences and a podcast about entrepreneurship, lifestyle, and self-care. There she is on the screen if you're watching. Look how happy she looks. By the end of 2020, she had quit her job as a K-6 through music teacher and expanded her business into coaching. Her company, Dallas Girl Gang, generated more than $178,000 in revenue last year. Shelby Ashworth is next. She stopped teaching for more flexible hours and created an Etsy store. There she is on the screen if you're watching. Uh, she's from just around the corner in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She launched an Etsy shop in 2016, selling handwritten prints and templates for extra income. Listen to this, teachers. She always loved incorporating design and creative elements into her lesson plans as a kindergarten and preschool teacher. So she let her contract expire in May 2021. Listen to this. This is a fantastic pivot. She pivoted into a job in graphic design. Now, one of the things I get from a lot of teachers who know that their time in public school is done is they call me and they say, Ken, 
help me with some ideas. What can I do? And one of the first things I like to say to them is, hey, you have skills and experience that are transferable. You aren't limited or locked into a public school classroom. And that's a lesson for all of us today. Just because we've been, and we get this from military men and women who call the show. Ken, I, I don't think I can do anything in the private sector. And so this is a, this is a, a factor of doubt that a lot of people deal with. And I want to encourage your heart. That is a false narrative. I don't care what field you have been in. You have skills, hard skills, soft skills, otherwise known as people skills, and experience that is in fact transferable. Here's the point. You aren't limited. So Shelby gets a job as a graphic designer. And she continued her side hustle on Etsy. The goal? To move full-time into her Etsy business. Love that. Haley Jones got her real estate license to sell houses as a side hustle. She's from Knoxville, Tennessee. Taught math for eight years. Um, she worked at the district level as a STEM coordinator for a couple of years, hoping to implement, implement change after leaving the actual classroom and couldn't find a solution. So in 2020, she got a real estate license and quit teaching. Last year, she made $164,000 in commission. Aubrey Malik left education to become a virtual assistant. Now, this is a great example. We heard the graphic design, but you think about how many teachers are very organized, administratively gifted, planners, executors. Well, you think about the world of virtual assistant. You can work in your house in your sweats and eat Rocky Road ice cream and take care of some executive on the other side of the country. It's very doable. So she's from Olean, New York. And uh, so she got out, launched her, and started as a virtual assistant. And then, this is great, she launched a course called The Prep to show other teachers how to use their administrative skills to become virtual assistants. This is amazing. So she goes and gets a day job as a virtual assistant and then goes, huh, I think other teachers could do this. I'm going to create a course to help them do it. And she did it. You ready for this? Listen to this. Last year. She generated over $105,000 in revenue just from the course. It's fantastic. All right, next story. And some of you are going to laugh when I read this headline, but this has some implications. Pizza has a delivery problem. CNN. In March, Domino's then-CEO Rich Allison warned that driver shortage would be a drag on business. He was right in the first three months of 2022. Delivery at Domino's U.S. stores fell by 10.7% year over year. Overall, sales at the stores that uh, had delivery problem issues uh, fell 3.6% due to the fact they just can't get guys to deliver or gals to deliver pizza. Not just Domino's, Pizza Hut. Uh, sales in the United States dropped 6% in the first quarter due to our delivery channel where capacity constraints limited our, our ability to meet demand. Don't you love corporate speak? That's part of the problem, that kind of a statement. Where capacity constraints limited our ability to meet demand. They can't hire people because they don't, they don't know how to attract talent. So a lot of solutions they're working through. Here's the fun takeaway. Papa John's has faced some staffing shortages, but this is from their CEO, Robert Lynch. We feel pretty good about staffing. Our premium positioning is a different model than the folks who are talking about staffing. There's the corporate speak again. <laughs> he goes, we're premium price. We don't require as many transactions. Would you all like me to decode that? It means their pizza costs more because it's better. They're not struggling. This is not an endorsement of Papa John's, but I'm just telling you. Papa John's, better pizza. You make your own decision. This is the Ken Coleman Show.
Did you know recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make sure your resume is getting noticed. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process and land your dream job. To get started, go to KenColeman.com slash resume. All right, folks, well, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, helping you discover and do what you were born to do so you make more money and make a greater impact. Thrilled to have you with us. Uh, we'll get in the chat room here a little bit later uh, with uh, the YouTube crazies, but Mr. E gives me a shout-out. He was very happy, very satisfied, shall we say, that I did the paper crinkle. The, the YouTube crazies like that silly little technique, and uh, I'm happy to oblige because at the end of the day, I'm just a big ham, uh, and we like the applause. So uh, it's good to have everybody with us. All right, let's get to the phones. It's time for coaching. 844-747-2577. The coaching session is for you. Let's go to Tori in Denver, Colorado. Tori, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thank you for taking my call today. You bet, Tori. What's up? Well, I recently received some rather unsettling news, and I need some help to figure out if I may be overreacting or perhaps I should start inching toward the exit. Okay, tell me, what's going on? Well, I recently graduated with a degree in graphic design. While in school, I read your book, The Proximity Principle, and I used its teachings to help me find my current job at a printing company. I've been with the company for a little over eight months now, mm -hmm. and I seem to be doing well. On my recent review, I received the, received the maximum points in all categories, and nice. I was recently recruited for an opportunity in another department, which I took because my old department was rather toxic. Right. Um, the work is not terribly challenging, but I'm content with it at the moment. Anyway, I found out last week that the board has decided to only give raises this year to the executives. Hmm. When I found out, I was just completely floored and disgusted. Hmm. I, <laughs> I'm i going, oh, what the heck? What gives? So right. I'm trying to figure out if perhaps I should stay at least until I've been with the company for a year or if I should quit on principle. So did you get a bump when you, you've only been there eight months total, is that correct? <laughs> Yes. Sir. Did you get a bump when you got the second gig? Unfortunately, no. But I figured, you know, I just had my review, so they're bound to give raises then. Yeah, you got a great review. Mm hmm And you got a promotion after the review? And no, no promotion. Just a it was just a lateral move to, oh, okay. from one department to the other. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out because that's that seems mm -hmm. a little bit off there. Um, so it was a lateral mm -hmm. move, but you got a really good review. So yes, clearly, sir. how many people are in this uh, print shop? Oh, goodness. Uh, a printing company? There's the office side and the production side. I think altogether there's about uh, four to 500 employees. Oh, my. Okay. We're uh, big. Yeah, that's, not, that's a really good size small business there. Um, and so the board has voted only the top leadership. Who does that include? Is that four or five leaders, three leaders? What's that look like? Oh, unfortunately, I don't have a number. So how did you hear number, the news? How did you hear the news? I have a really good source who was in the room when the vote was taking place. Oh, boy. Oh, man. And he said, all your fears or this is all sticky. the cliches about the board have been fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, this is sticky. This is really sticky and sucky. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Because what's happened here is somebody told you something you weren't supposed to know. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot of psychological effect on you. You already said it. You were disgusted. I mean, you're feeling, you're feeling like you want to leave today, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. So we have two issues. Number one, you're, you know something you're not supposed to know. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's awful. And, and I would just, I, I feel bad for you because you didn't ask for that information, I'm guessing. Is that right? 
I had just made a comment about how, you know, I'm just waiting to hear back about the raises and, or my raise and my colleague said, oh, it's not happening. Okay. So this is why. So this is why I feel bad for you because you didn't ask. You were just making a normal comment and this, this coworker decided to drop this on you. Now Mm -hmm. I'm not a natural cynic, but I got to tell you, I'd like to verify that. I, how much do you trust this person? I trust this person implicitly. He has no reason to lie to me. Yeah, but he, he has a reason for spreading dissension. Because let me let me put it this way. You've done nothing wrong here. And I feel bad for you. Like really awful. Um, I don't know that you're going to be able to stay here much longer. That's the psychological impact this has. Um, mm-hmm. I'll get to that in a moment. But I want you to understand what he has done to you. You didn't ask for this information. He drops it on you. He dropped it on you because he's pissed or he's unhealthy or whatever. But there was nothing good that comes out of that because let me put it to you this way. Had you not heard that information, would you be calling me right now? No, sir. As much as I enjoy your show. (laughs) No, no, I appreciate that. That's honest. You you know why? Because you didn't need my opinion. Or you didn't want my opinion prior to that, right? Because here's my point. It wasn't an issue. You were happy to stay there. So the, mm-hmm. so this is what we have to deal with right now. You have been unfortunately pulled into something that you didn't ask to be pulled into, and it's had a negative effect on you. And you just admitted that had you not known that information, you wouldn't even be thinking about leaving this company. You'd be going, all right, I made a lateral move. The work's not that challenging because you have admitted that. But, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to stick it out. I've only been here eight months. I'm fresh out of college. Your perspective would have been totally different. So that matters as you decide what you need to do. Now, let me address something you said a moment ago. You leaving after eight months to take a better job in this job economy at this season of the way the world is and everybody's changing jobs No one's going to look at you as a flake if you take a better job tomorrow, six weeks from now, three months from now. So you don't have to worry about being considered a job hopper. I taught on this last week. We need to start looking at job hopping as a good thing as long as we're hopping up. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So I don't want you to worry about job hopping and being perceived as whatever. Um because you've got a job right now that's not very challenging to you. So if they don't move you up in the next six to nine months, you're going to be looking for the exit anyway, despite knowing the fact that you're not getting a raise this year. Mm-hmm. Probably. So the only reason you stay, in my opinion, is because you think you're getting valuable experience. It's going to set you up and you don't think the timing's right for you to move. Yes, sir. What do you think? After all I've, all I've said... What do you think? You have another question that I could address because that's about all I can give you. Is uh, it's your call right now? What well, are you feeling? The biggest thing that's holding me in place actually is, um, well, again, yes, the eight months, but also I'm still on baby step two, and also I'm planning on going to school next year. But at the same time, I'm going. I don't know if I want to work for people who don't value their employees. Well, so. I can just tell you, you don't. So you've already answered my question. Mm-hmm. You, you're damaged. It's not your fault, but that you've, you've got damaged trust with your leaders. That's not your fault. You're not the bad guy here. So yeah. let me encourage you. You can change jobs while in baby step two for non Ramsey show listeners. That means baby step two. She's paying off her debt. Smallest to largest. Okay. You can change jobs without ever missing a paycheck. True or false? At this point. True. No, it, any point you can change jobs meaning you stay mm-hmm. where you are and you're mm-hmm. a big girl and you're mature and you do your job until you find another job and then you walk from one dock to the other dock simple there's no mm-hmm. jumping out in the water here so your baby steps will not be interrupted in fact if you do this right you get a raise your baby steps get accelerated you feel me yes sir all right Tori, you're awesome. By the way, it says here on the screen, you're Ducky in the YouTube chat room. Is that true? (laughs) Yes, sir. (laughs) Oh, I love it when a YouTube crazy dials into the show. Tori, you're great. Listen, I feel really bad for Tori. And a lot of you have been psychologically damaged. Let's call it what it is. 
by a gossiping coworker. Um, and I know she trusts this guy and I'm not trying to bang on him, but I'm going to tell you right now, that's gossip. And it has collateral damage. Tori, unfortunately, has been caught up in that. And I, I hate that. But she's got options. And so do you. Don't move. This is The Ken Coleman Show. You were created to fill a unique role in and through your work. Now, some of you may be going, I have no idea what that is. Some of you may be saying, I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to get there. I felt all of those emotions. I've been where you are, and I can tell you, there's hope. That's why I wrote the book, From Paycheck to Purpose. You can make the income you want and the impact that you desire, and I know that you have what it takes. Anybody else hungry for a for a slice of pizza? I feel like I am. Uh, if you're just joining us, I covered a story uh, in our in the news segment earlier in the show about how pizza delivery companies are struggling to get drivers, and uh, as as they do, and this is why I love them, the YouTube crazies are chiming in in the chat room. So I got to get to Amy. We got to do another coaching call, but I'm going to tell you this next segment. Uh, we're going to dive into the YouTube crazies comments on frozen pizzas. A couple have thrown out a couple of brands to me. Ken, what do you think about Tombstone? DiGiorno? That's all I've seen so far. Uh, so we'll dive in. We'll spend a couple minutes on my f favorite frozen pizza. Because I have one. And uh, I don't like to frequent that aisle. This is not good for my dad bot. You know what I'm saying? But uh, there are some good ones. And so maybe we'll have a little bit of fun in the chat room. If you uh, want to comment away, go ahead. We'll get to it. Amy's up next in Nashville, our neighborhood right around the corner. Amy, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thank you so much for taking my call. You bet, Amy. What's up? So I work for a company who is still currently implementing uh, COVID vaccine policies. And they seem to be pretty heavily excluding people who have chosen to either not get vaccinated or not disclose their vaccination status. Um, to even come into the office, they require that you have your vaccination um, on record with the company. Um, and I'm now seeing them start to exclude people from like town halls um, and like all company meetings that are being held in person, but are main, may not be live streamed for those who cannot attend in person. Um, and I'm just wondering if this is a red flag that I should consider leaving my company over. Yeah. Wow. That's a good question. Um, has there been any mention of kind of a threat or a deadline by which you would have to have the vax and prove the vax? Or is it just, this is kind of feels like a passive aggressive. They're just, if, if you don't, if you don't have your vax, um, then you can't come to these meetings and we're not going to let you know anything about it. Kind of a passive aggressive move. Is that all this is, or is there more detail about, Hey, we are going to enforce this. It seems more passive aggressive at the moment, but I've seen some comments made by, you know, executive leadership um, that managers should be pushing this with their employees. Are you a manager? Um, I am personally not a manager, but I'm in a leadership role. Are you a remote worker, hybrid, or in office? Uh, I am technically remote right now because I'm not allowed to be in the office. That's what I thought. All right, so you're mandated remote, but there, but there's, sure. it doesn't seem as though there's any plans for you not to be able to continue working remote. Uh, not at the moment, but they are, they're definitely making it harder to work remotely because of the things that they are right, doing let me in the ask office you this. and excluding remote if, employees. Okay. If they weren't doing this, would you be thinking about moving on? Not necessarily. Um, I do like my company. I've kind of thought about exploring other options, but I think nothing outside to. of that has, yeah. I think you have to. My advice is now. We have to prepare. I did a show on this issue, I don't know, a week or so ago. It's all Groundhog Day. I don't even know why I try to remember when <laughs> I do it, Amy. But we did this uh, recently, and let me recall this teaching for you. 
when we all get on the airplane, before we take off, the flight attendants come on and they do the old obligatory announcements and they show us, hey, we're not expecting an emergency, but if we were to have a water landing and they show you all the things and they go talk to the exit row people. So what they're doing is they're going, look, there's a low rate of this happening, uh, but we're still going to prepare you for the exit. And so my advice to you is, and the, the whole show teaching that day was, look, even if you're in a great culture, great company, great job, all the things are great, you should always have an exit strategy, right? I do this when I go to amusement parks. I'm a dad. I can't help it. And so when we go into the little theaters for the shows, you know, I'm always going, all right, if something were to go wiggy, wiggy, crazy, how am I getting my kids to safety? I'm just telling you, that's what I do. And mm -hmm. so I think this is the same thing here. It's more intent for you, though, because you have a, I'm going to call it a yellow flag, not a red flag. I don't think sure. this is an emergency exit, but I do think you need to know where the exits are. And what I mean by that is you need to be looking at companies um, and looking for opportunities right now. Right now. Starts today. And if we find a better opportunity that's not a yellow flag, it's a green flag, same industry, different industry, I don't care. You take it. I'd take it. I'd take it now. But just being ready and aware will take the worry away. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, talent, the work you love to do, passion, and the results you want your work to produce. That's mission. Then you're gonna feel way more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go now to kencoleman.com slash clarity. Helping you discover and do what you were born to do. This is the Ken Coleman Show. More money, more impact. And part of that, by the way, is helping you get the job, right? The competitive edge. Think of me as your coach. I want to help you beat the competition because you are in a competition. One of the ways we do that is uh, not just through the teaching, the content, the resources we create, but partnerships like ZipRecruiter, the number one hiring site in the United States. ZipRecruiter understands the job process can be icky, sucky, frustrating, lonely, all the things. And so their artificial intelligence does a lot of the work for you. They send you job opportunities for you to apply to with one click, not fill out a new resume every time. And because they're Zip and because companies are paying ZipRecruiter for access to you, not only is it a free service for you, but you stand out because while you're doing your life, they're pitching you to companies that have positions that match up to your profile. Again, no brainer, ZipRecruiter.com. ZipRecruiter.com. All right, I got to get to the chat room. They had some pizza suggestions. Uh, we were talking about delivery companies struggling to deliver pizza. So, of course, the YouTube crazies are trying to save a buck or two. They start throwing out, hey, Ken, what do you think about this brand of frozen uh, pizzas? So Gary Spratt is one of the – he might be our chief crazy. I might have to give him the hat, chief crazy. Uh, he says DiGiorno's. I'm okay with DiGiorno's. It's not great. It's not awful. Uh, Tombstone. Uh, Tombstone, I'm going to say, is good, not great as well. I put both of those in the same category. Not my first choice. Uh, somebody in here threw Costco out. And um, I got to tell you, oh, geez, hold on. Before I comment on Costco, because I got some comments on Costco pizza. Somebody put Lean Cuisine in here. Are you kidding me? Grant, Grant Lowry, I need your man card, sir. Can somebody revoke Grant's man card for suggesting lean cuisine pizza? Uh, okay, so I'm looking at the here. Let me get this get this over. So let me tell you what what. So I got two teenage boys, fourteen and sixteen. They're literally eating me out of the house. It's unbelievable. So. You know, frozen pizza is not the greatest thing in the world for you, but kids eat it, and so we go get it in bulk. So, Alex, I got to tell you this. The other day, she brought home some deep dish uh, pizza from Costco. Meat lovers, unbelievable, Nathan. I would eat it with you watching a Vikings game. It, it's that good. 
You would never know if I pulled it out of the oven. You would never know it was from Costco. It's it's in a square. It's it's just really really good. So I got to tell you, my vote for the best frozen pizza right now is the Costco deep dish. I don't know what the brand is, but you can go find it. So there you go. This is the kind of content that's extra. And you know what? It makes your life better. You know it. I know it. So there you go. All right, let's get back to the phones for another coaching session. Jo Speaking of the Vikings, Nathan, Joshua on the line from Minneapolis. Joshua, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, how are you, Ken? I'm living the dream, Joshua. What's going on? Good. So um, I basically, I am 23 years old. I graduated in December of 2020 with a bachelor's degree in marketing. Um, and right out of college, um, it was kind of a rough market for jobs. And so I just took a position as a customer service associate at a large company, uh, one that I know has a good reputation. Um, I'm just now hit a year in that job and I really liked it at first. Um, it was a good start, but now I am really just dreading it every day. The department is just really going downhill and I'm just ready to get out of there, but I'm not really sure what I want to do anymore. Okay, good. So let's look for some clues in what you like and what you dread. You just shared that you've got both of those emotions. So before you dreaded this job, you said you really liked it. What specifically did you like about it? Give me everything. Tasks, coworkers, leader, environment. Think of everything you liked about it at the time. What was that? Um, I think I just really liked the challenge of being able to help out each customer to the best of my ability. And now I've really just figured out how to solve every problem that I just feel like it's so repetitive. And okay, great. That is really a that terrific clue. More. Okay, that's a great clue. So while you loved helping customers at first, now you don't because you don't have a challenge. But you did like helping customers. So as we look for something new, there needs to be some recognition that, well, another job that could work for me is still one in a customer service role, but a much more challenging, maybe evolving role. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. You're yeah. still going to always in, like helping people. So when we master something, we get bored. And one of the number one causes of burnout is boredom. You're bored. Mm -hmm. You're like, you can do it with your eyes closed. Spin you around, smack you in the head. You can still help, right? Yep. That's part of it. What else did you like, if anything else? Um, That was pretty much it for the most part. Okay. The, you said, though, the department's going downhill. That speaks to your environment. And I don't know anybody that likes to be on a losing team except for Vikings fans. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. I had to say that because Nathan is there and you're in Minneapolis. I'm kidding. You guys are going to get better, I promise. Hang in there. It's just a cheap shot. It was it was a cheap shot, Nathan. I'm so sorry. Joshua, it was a cheap <laughs> shot. I'm sorry. But you, you get my point. Nobody likes to be on a losing team, right? Exactly. So how much of that is factoring into this? Um. Well, being I'm a very competitive person, it's kind of a big factor. Bingo. Um, Bingo. You're looking at other divisions going, man, sure would like to be over there, right? Exactly. Do you feel shame? Um, Kind of. I mean, I, I'm i just, I feel like I'm pulling my weight a lot and just not getting the help from uh -huh. coworkers around me. Or even I feel like management is even having a hard time like picking up on that. Yeah, so you're frustrated, aren't you? Yes. You've had it. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you fix it? Yes oh. or no? Yes or no? Can you fix this problem? No, I cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Is it your fault? No. Okay. Now, how do you feel? Well, it feels good not being the problem. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and what have you figured out? You and I just talking back and forth. What do you think is the biggest issue now? Um, I think the biggest issue is just the management and like the feeling that I just really want to get out of there. But yeah. the biggest issue is I'm just not sure even what to look for. Like there I'm not even go. sure what I really want to do. Okay, great. So it's ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was hoping you would say, and I'm here to coach you. So the issue is not 
ideas. The issue is ideating, right? Looking, Mm -hmm. starting to look. So here's what we know. We know you love doing people work, correct? You, you like working with people and people problems, right? Yes. Yeah. See, there's, there's, there's four buckets of work, people work, ideal work, which is kind of the space I'm in. I'm in idea and people, and then I'm coaching people, but I'm creating content all the day. So I'm doing people and idea work, but then there's process work, right? Those are developers and, 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 you know, operations people and project managers. And then there's things work. And what I mean by that is people fixing stuff, HVACs, cars, you know what I'm talking about? Carpenters, building, does you see what I'm saying? Yep, yep. You're in the people bucket is what I feel. Is that true? Yeah, I would say that's pretty true. All right, then stop. Lo- start looking today for people related jobs, meaning I'm people facing, I'm people helping. I'm solving people problems with what I do best, listening, discerning, analyzing. That's your jam. Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, then that's industry. Why there's, that's not one industry. That's multiple industries. So I think it's a little intimidating when we go, okay, it's not here, but where? And that's the right question. But instead of looking where, I want you thinking about what. This is the type of work, the what I want to do, and this is why I want to do it. When you're focusing on the what, people-focused work, why? Because I really like interacting with people and solving their problems and kind of coming in as that servant, guide, instructor, swami, whatever. Am I still making sense? Does this all sound like you? Yes, it does. Okay. So we now know the what and the why, and now as you're looking out there, the where will take care of itself. You got it? Gotcha. Joshua, mm-hmm. you got this. You just need to look, man, because now you know what you're looking for. You got this, man. And hey, I'm sorry for the shot at the Vikings. I'm going to have to pay for that with Nathan. I got to get out of here and take my punishment. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.